Hey guys and welcome back to the channel where I bring you this Socket 7 PC. Not the same as I showed you in the last video. I know I promised to do a follow up on that one and I will but I have some problems with my video capturing setup. So I'm going to show you this one instead which is going to go to a friend later today. So I thought I'd do a quick video on it. And I love these types of cases. CD-ROM, 3.5 inch disk drive, fake disk drive, power button, and a really cool LED strip with reset button, turbo button, keyboard lock, and this beautiful black finish with the door that can open and close on the tower. This is pure 90s goodness. So this is a beautiful case and the guy that's going to receive it has this thing for these types of cases. Turbo button, reset button, speed indication and beige black combination. So who can blame him? On the back we have a very traditional layout, standard AT power supply, AT style keyboard connector, two serial ports, one parallel port, a VGA connector and a sound card. Standard stuff. Now don't let the 50 megahertz speed indicator fool you because this is a Pentium class machine, socket 7 machine and when we start it up this is what we see. So it's not your traditional Intel or AMD CPU but this is a IBM branded 6 X86MX-PR200. A CPU which is running at 150 megahertz but can compete with a Pentium 200 megahertz, according to the manufacturer that is. So it had Windows 98 installed. Excuse me for the bad quality of the video capturing. I still need to figure out what exactly is going on here with the weird stripes on the screen. But as you can see it loads up Windows 98 just fine and it's always nice to see these familiar desktop icons and the little fluffy clouds in the background. So that's some nostalgia for you right there. So let's open up the Explorer. So this computer came from Belgium so it's in Dutch. So we can see that this is a Cyrix 6x86MX CPU with 16 megabytes of RAM. Sound drivers aren't installed. It came with an ATI graphics Mach 64, has a CD-ROM drive, the standard two serial ports, one printer port, all the basic stuff. So this was kind of a budget PC probably because the video card isn't the most powerful one, neither is the sound card. And the CPU was also considered a budget CPU when compared to the Intel and AMD offerings. A funny thing is that this computer came installed with root 66. So for those of you that don't know, so this is how we did maps back in the day. If we wanted to have directions or load up a certain city and a country, we would not load up Google Maps, but we would load up route 66. And this is how a map looked like. So only available on Windows, not available on your phone. No fancy satellite images. Just this no-nonsense technical interface to calculate your route from point A to point B. This is how we did it, folks, back in the day. This is how we did it. And before I shut down the computer, I just want to see that beautiful Microsoft Office 97 splash screen again from Microsoft Word. Something that I saw countless of times back in the day. So, yeah. Really, really nice. So I'm just going to turn off the PC right now because I'm going to do a fresh install of Windows 98 on this machine just to see if the machine is running more or less stable. And here is the iconic you can turn off your computer now screen in Dutch. So here I've taken the liberty of opening up the PC. We have the power supply, CD-ROM drive, disk drive, hard drive. We have two expansion cards here. We have some flat cables for the serial parallel ports. We have a VGA card, sound card, and behind this cooler we have the CPU. 
So let's go ahead and take the expansion cards out of the PC. Starting with this ATI Mach 64 PCI video card. A pretty common graphics card back in the day, not the most powerful one, not the slowest one, just your average PCI 2D video card. Don't expect to do a lot of 3D gaming on this card. Next up is the sound card. Now, despite the fact that it's covered in dust, you can see that this is an advanced Logic ALS 100 Plus card. This was a very common budget card back in the day. Nothing really special about it, just your average 16-bit ISA plug-and-play sound card from the mid-90s. You know, it ran fine in Windows 98. There was nothing really special about it. It was just in, in a lot of PCs back in the day that didn't have an actual creative sound blaster. Moving on to the hard drive. A standard IDE hard drive from Fujitsu Limited. I'm not really sure what the size of this thing is. This is a drive from 1998. I'm suspecting that this is going to be something like a 3 gig drive, judging from the model number. Now inside we also have these brackets for the two serial ports and also for the parallel port. So these Socket 7 mainboards have a lot of integrated I.O. on the mainboard, so you don't need separate expansion cards for serial parallel ports. The IDE interfaces are also present on the mainboard as well as the floppy drive connector, so we'll go ahead and remove those. And then remove the IDE cable so that we can get a better view of the mainboard. This little cable here is to power the front uh, LED panel, so I'm going to disconnect that as well. And now we have the uh, computer emptied except for the main board. Now, I'm going to be opening up the front panel because I do want to show you the LED uh, speed indicator here. So as you can see, we have lots of jumpers here, and this is to set the actual speed in megahertz that you want to display on the LEDs, because this is not determined by the main board or anything. It's just a manual thing that you need to configure using these jumpers. Now, this in itself deserves a video on its own, because there is no real standard in terms of setting up such an LED display. There are lots of different ones. Some of them are documented, some of them aren't. And without documentation, some trial and error is involved. And here we also see the plus 5 volts and the ground pin, the two pins which are needed to power up the LED display. And this is the 5 volt that needs to come from the power supply. Now this case has a very interesting feature in the sense that there are two parts at the bottom here and there are two screws that you can unscrew to open up half of the bottom of the case. And with this little uh, metal plate removed, we have access to the main board and we can in fact slide out the main board through this uh, hole here on the bottom of the case. So let's go ahead and remove all of these cables here from the main board so that we can slide the main board out without having any cables attached to it. So yeah, it's a nifty little design feature of this case to get uh, easy access to the main board. So here I've laid out all of the components that make up our little Pentium PC. So we can now look at each every individual component in much more detail and we'll start by looking at the main board of this PC. And the main board is a Matsonic main board which is actually just a rebranded PC chips main board using the Aladdin 4 Plus chipset to accommodate higher front side bus speeds that this IBM CPU needs. So I'm going to start by removing the CPU cooler and the CPU cooler also has a nifty design feature in the sense that it has two screws here that will loosen up the two clips 
that hold on the CPU cooler to the socket uh, 7 on the main board. So as you can see with the screwdriver we can now simply pull it up and the cooler can be removed. And here we see the IBM 6x86MX PR200 CPU. PR stands for Pentium Rating, which is a rating system to uh, compare the speed of the CPU to an Intel Pentium based CPU. Now this IBM CPU has a PR rating of 200, meaning that it can compete with an Intel Pentium 200 MHz, despite the fact that this one only runs at 150. This 6x86MX CPU supports MMX extensions. This chip also features 64 kilobytes of level 1 cache, which is a lot more than the 16 kilobytes of cache that comes in the original Intel Pentium MMX CPUs. And that's why you see this PR rating, because inherently this CPU is going to be faster, although the overall performance is going to suffer due to a lacking floating point unit in the CPU. As you can see on the CPU, it runs at a 75 megahertz frontside bus speed with a multiplier of two. So we can set the multiplier here with jumper five. So by specifying a multiplier of two, we get 75 megahertz frontside bus times two, which gives us an internal clock speed of 150 megahertz. And through some fancy marketing by IBM, they turned the 150 megahertz, which is the actual clock speed of the CPU, they turned that into a Pentium rating of 200, meaning that this CPU is the equivalent of a Pentium 200 megahertz. We can also specify the CPU voltage using jumper 6. So the main board supports a variety of different voltages. This IBM CPU uses 2.9 volts, although the main board is configured to use 2.8 volts. Now towards the top of the main board, we have jumper seven, which indicates the front side bus speed that the CPU should be operated on. So for this IBM CPU, we have it set to 75 megahertz. So if you would be installing an Intel Pentium MMX CPU, you would set this to 66 megahertz. Not all socket seven main boards will support a front side bus speed greater than 66 megahertz, which is the kind of official front side bus speed that traditional Pentium and Pentium MMX CPUs would use. This unusual 75 megahertz front side bus speed also violates the PCI specifications that the PCI bus should run at 33 megahertz, which is half of the front side bus, which is typically 66 megahertz. So this IBM will be pushing the PCI bus speed all the way up to 37.5 megahertz, which is over the official 33 megahertz. So we briefly touched upon the CPU cooler in the system and I really like this uh, design with these kind of thumb screws here that lower these little clips that uh, hold the CPU cooler uh, onto the CPU socket. I really like this type of design. It makes it very easy to uh, remove the CPU cooler and it also allows for a very firm fit of the CPU cooler on the CPU. Now the CPU cooler was very dirty, so it was definitely worthwhile to take it apart and clean it up a little bit so that we can remove most of the dust which has accumulated not only on the heatsink but also on the CPU fan itself. So yeah, good cleaning uh, was definitely needed here. So now we can put the CPU cooler back on the CPU and use these thumb screws here to securely fasten it. Continuing the tour of the main board, we see that we have two types of power connectors. We have the ATX style power connector as well as the AT style power connector. We also have two types of keyboard connectors. We have the AT style DIN based connector, but also a PS2 connector for the keyboard. The main board also features lots of I.O. So we have not only a floppy drive and this drive uh, 
connectors. We also have two serial ports and a parallel port. Two types of RAM can be installed on this machine. So we have both SD RAM as well as Edo RAM support. The main board came with 16 megabytes of RAM, which isn't a lot, but it'll do for now. We have a total of five PCI slots and three 32-bit ISA slots. We have a coin cell battery, so no danger of leaking batteries. Here we see the CPU cooler that we discussed. Here we have some connectors to hook up the case LEDs. We have an ALI or Ali Aladdin 4 Plus chipset on this main board. ALI is a division from Acer as indicated by this chip here. And this chipset was needed to support the higher bus speeds like 75 and 83 megahertz for the new upcoming AMD and Cyric based CPUs. We have 512 kilobytes of level 2 cache. And here we have the BIOS chip from AMI. I thought I did some screen recordings of this BIOS, which is kind of a Windows based uh, BIOS with mouse support, but I've seemed to have lost this footage. So the caps on the board also seem to be in really good shape although you cannot really be 100% sure but it's already a good visual indication and this leads us to the video card which is an ATI Mac 64 PCI based video card with one megabyte of memory released in 1995 so this is a 2D video card it doesn't do any kind of 3D acceleration it also doesn't excel in its 2D performance, so this is a card that you would typically find in a budget system like this. Same goes for the sound card, which is the Advanced Logic ALS 100 Plus. This is just kind of a Sound Blaster compatible, cheap sound card that you would see in lots of budget PCs from back in the day. But as with a lot of things, it's not only the performance that counts. It's the fact that this is a gorgeous looking AT style case. And with a operating system like Windows 98, the PC does pretty well. You can play DOS games on it. I did have an issue with the door that all of a sudden didn't want to close anymore or didn't want to close completely anymore. I guess you start to see some wear on these plastic clips over time. So yeah, I'm hoping that the future owner of this case will be able to solve this. But I was able to install Windows 98 second edition without any issues. It didn't throw any errors or there were no uh, weird reboots that you sometimes have with PCs that aren't running very stable. All in all, the installation went really well. I didn't notice any issues at all and after a couple of reboots and configuration settings I finally was able to boot into the Windows 98 desktop that we love so much. So let's go into the system properties here. So we again have the Cyrix Instead CPU and on the device manager you see that we still need to install the sound card but our VGA card has been detected, the CD-ROM drive, both the hard drive and disk drive. So all of the standard stuff seems to be working. I did decide to swap the ATI Mac 64 with my 3D Blaster Voodoo Banshee card just to play some games on it. And although I couldn't really tell much of a difference between this CPU and the Intel Pentium 200 MMX. I will be putting it head on with my Intel Pentium 200 MMX system that I showed in my previous video. So please stay tuned for that as we will be comparing the two CPUs in much more detail. So as I'll be needing this IBM CPU to do my benchmarking, I have decided to swap the CPUs on this system, remove the IBM CPU, 
and replace it with this Intel Pentium 200 MMX CPU. I think the new owner of the system will be happy with it. I think it will provide an overall better experience and possibly also a more stable experience. So yeah, I think this is going to be a win-win situation. So I hope you've enjoyed this little video. I hope you've enjoyed this beautiful AT style case. And as always, if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you like this kind of content, please consider subscribing. And I hope to see you guys soon. Bye-bye.